behalf of the uh, Institute on National Affairs, I'm just welcoming you all here this evening. Um, this is funded by PSC, it's also a co sponsor of this evening by the Indian School of Journalism and Communication and Political Science. I can I'll just speak really loudly. Okay. So, um, so after the words, there'll be a reception following. You can all come to this. Uh, tonight's lecture is obviously the Patriot Act in Iowa. Uh, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, Charles Larson, and U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, Steve Romero, will join uh, IA West Civil Liberties Executive Director Ben Stone, and we'll be having this discussion tonight facilitated by Dr. Barbara Mack. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. Is he there? And now it really is off. Ah, I'm used to keeping 300 freshmen away. <laughs> I can deal with you people. You're not off, you're dealing with me. <laughs> now, yeah. I think I'll feel like Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not quite enough cord, but maybe make sure. There we go. I think that will suit us a little better. Can you all hear? Yeah. All right. Not since, in my opinion, 1798 has the United States been involved in such an intense discussion of a measure passed by Congress that attempts to balance the nation's need for defense and the nation's need for security against the civil liberties which we hold so dear. Tonight we have an extraordinary panel who are going to discuss with you the USA Patriot Act passed by Congress six weeks after the events of September 11th. We have here both of the sitting U.S. Attorneys General for the State of Iowa and the Executive Director of the Iowa Civil Liberties Union, Ben Stone. The panelists will share, um, our first two panelists will share 20 minutes in a formal presentation. Uh, ben Stone will have 20 minutes to respond and we intend to leave a lot of time for questions because it's this kind of public discussion that is going to generate what we hope will be the consensus with which we can all live. I'm going to take advantage of my time at the microphone to introduce all of our panelists. Um, I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. In the middle of the table, allow me to introduce to you Charles Larson, who is the U United States Attorney for the Northern District of Iowa. He was appointed by President Bush in October of 2001. Prior to this, he was the chairman of the Iowa Board of Parole and was a member of the President's Drug-Free Communities Commission from 1998 to 2002. He was also director of the Governor's Office of Drug Control, Drug Control Policy pardon me, for five years. He also served as the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Iowa between 1986 and 1993. He has lived in Saudi Arabia. He has been active in public safety and issues of public safety and is a retired colonel in the Army Reserve. On the far, on my far right at the table, closest to me, is Stephen Patrick O'Meara. Mr. O'Meara is the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Iowa, lives in Des Moines. He is a native of Des Moines, uh, is a Creighton lawyer started his career as a trial lawyer in Des Moines, but very quickly moved into government service and was a, an assistant Iowa attorney general, was the county attorney for Page County, then became an assistant U.S. attorney in <coughs> Omaha, moved to the Des Moines office of the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1990, and was recently appointed as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Iowa. Ben Stone, many of you may know, he is the executive director of the Iowa Civil Liberties Union that is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization founded here in Iowa in 1935. It's affiliated with the American Civil Liberties Union and is the fifth oldest ACLU affiliate in the nation. 
Mr. Stone is also a native of Des Moines. We've got a lot of homegrown talent here tonight, don't we? Graduated with honors from Drake Law School in 1995 and obtained a master's degree in history and philosophy from Iowa State University in 1990. He joined the ICLU in 1996 and prior to that time worked with Parish Pride near Moss and Dunn in Des Moines. This is indeed a panel which will provide thought-provoking discussion and I think a multimedia presentation. Be prepared with your best and wisest questions. Mr. Larson, the floor is yours. Ms. Mack, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to see you again this evening, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you folks, and I'm confident we will uh, be able to answer some of your questions, give you some background on the Patriot Act, and uh, you'll go home feeling more comfortable about it and understanding it better. Also uh, with us this evening, because sometimes in the past the questions have ranged beyond the Patriot Act, uh, and it has they, they have sort of been a mixture of uh, what involves military law uh, regarding people held in Guantanamo and things like that. And rather than just saying, well, that's not part of the Patriot Act, I'm not going to really get into that tonight. We uh, Patrick Reiner from our office, Pat, we just want to stand up, has joined, uh, has joined us. He's a colonel in the Army Reserves, a judge, and is called uh, to active duty from time to time to preside over military trials. So he's a person that has a good background in that area. If you have some questions, why we may divert to him when we're in the panel uh, format. Now I'd like to just uh, review some aspects of uh, the Patriot Act and then I'll uh, turn it over to my colleague who will go through some of the details and, and relate to you some of his experiences with similar laws. In fact, uh, we have uh, for you uh, the real definition. If you haven't uh, seen that in the past, now you'll get a chance to uh, see where the name came from. And of course, if you go to work with the government, you have to be up with all of the acronyms. Well, September 11th uh, changed our country perhaps forever. Congress quickly realized uh, that we were in a war that was the largest attack ever on the continental United States, the largest attack period because it actually killed more people than we lost uh, in Pearl Harbor. So we are reminded on a regular basis, daily basis, uh, that we are in this war. Congress gave the president certain uh, rights for that, and the Congress also then moved to pass the Patriot Act, sure, about the time I became U.S. Attorney again in the Northern District. And we ask ourselves, uh, will it happen again? Uh, and uh, perhaps yes, perhaps yes, that's an unanswered question. We certainly hope not. It's happening at small stages throughout the world, not as bad as the attack that occurred uh, on our country, but is continuing to happen. Can it happen here? That's a question that we ask too. Well, it's not likely because common sense tells you that terrorists want to make a great impact uh, on our country and they, they want to shock us and they want to kill hundreds. So it's not quite so apt to happen here, but are there relationships and can things take place here? Yes. Uh, you'll notice a picture of uh, uh, Mr. Himsa. Joseph Himsa was arrested in Cedar Rapids, uh, he had committed acts both in the Southern District and the Northern District that involved false documents relating to immigration, Social Security, and things of that nature, and recently pled guilty in uh, Detroit, where we well, he pled guilty here, and in this case was handled in Detroit, uh, and he testified then recently in a case that involved a group that were considered a sleeper cell, uh, and he has not yet been sentenced. So he was residing here in, uh, in Iowa. Uh, also, uh, we have seen uh, evidence uh, even in Cedar Rapids, and Scott, uh, or Todd, Todd Boder, who's with us this evening, is our intelligence officer, and uh, he noticed this over by the downtown Cedar Rapids uh, post office, marked uh, there on a transformer case, the ELF uh, graffiti symbol. ELF is, ELF is the, the Environmental Liberation uh, Front, and they're an organization that recently bragged about destroying $60 million worth of property in the United States, so they're considered domestic terrorists. ALF is also noted, and they have conducted acts in Iowa by releasing uh, minks and other, uh, conducting other uh, terrorist acts here in uh, our state. 
Well, the Patriot Act uh, is uh, really designed to uh, allow law enforcement and intelligence agencies to finally share information in a common sense approach. It also updates the law to reflect the new technologies. Now, Steve and O'Meara will get into some of the details of the technologies, how they've changed, why the law had to be updated. Common sense will tell you that, most of you. How many have a cell phone with you tonight? So, see, so. <laughs> what a Thank you. Thank you. Um, how much did you pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> so you have a cell phone with you, and you can just, your imagination will tell you, now let's see, if, we get a, if we're going to follow that cell phone and, and check on the numbers and the people they call, uh, it's not going to be just one location, one address in Cedar Rapids. It might be all over the country. It might be a throwaway phone. So St Stephen's going to get into more of those details. And it also increased certain penalties uh, that are involved with crimes related to terrorism. Now, uh, last October, hearings were held as to see how the act is going because I think, as uh, Ms. Mack said, it's created a lot of discussion. We haven't had a lot of heated discussion here in Iowa, but it has created discussion, and then the act called for follow-up uh, reports to Congress, and one of the early reports took place in this past October. I have just a few of those quotes uh, for you that you can glance at to show you that uh, oftentimes those that were might be critics were now more comfortable with the act after uh, individuals came in, testified, said how much it had been used or in fact had been used to check on library records and things of that nature. Senator Feingold was the one senator that voted against the act and he has even now uh, changed his position. One of the areas where the Congress quickly discovered is the fact that uh, the criminal investigators couldn't share evidence or information with intelligence investigators. This uh, wall really came up probably in 1975 with the church uh, investigations or hearings that were conducted because at that time it was discovered that uh, the law was such that if the Attorney General of the United States made a, f a finding that there was foreign intelligence information being conveyed between individuals in the United States and to other foreign governments, uh, then they could share that information if the Attorney General so approved it. Actually, at that time, the uh, investigation surrounded uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, uh, the Attorney General then was uh, Robert Kennedy, and he was approving then the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, to monitor certain activities going on. Congress conducted investigations under Senator Church, and they said, well, it's going too far. We ought to maybe need to do these things because we know the President of the United States is in charge of defending the United States, and there are times when uh, that President should have vast authority. But uh, we better have a court look and follow up on these items. So they established a court, the FISA court, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. And that consists of 11 judges who are appointed from among the federal judges. And then they come into Washington. And then they are the ones that approve search warrants and other activity that takes place that involves foreign intelligence activities. Now, Stephen will touch on some of the times when he would go to a federal judge in Des Moines or if he were working on foreign intelligence issues, then he would go to the FISA court in Washington. Actually, he, he and I won't be doing that because there's a special team of experts with the Justice Department that appear before that FISA court on a regular basis. But Congress decided we need to be able to exchange this information quickly. And thus, that was part of the Patriot Act for now. There can be a, a better exchange of information between investigative agencies and uh, our folks that are in the experts in the military and CIA. And in fact, they, even uh, with the war in Iraq, now there was some direct information that was a result of an ongoing criminal investigation in this country that was passed quickly to the military to key targets. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Stephen, who's going to uh, go through some other key parts of the act answer, and then we'll, I think we'll answer your question, Stephen O'Meara. Good evening. Judges have a hard time keeping me on podiums. So I'm going to try to stay here. <clears throat> kind of a quick summary of the Patriot Act, particularly as we might look at it in Iowa. Uh, if you notice, it's very heavy with regard to money crimes. And the reason for that is on the interior of the United States, a lot of the focus of the anti-terrorism effort 
uh, in addition to prevention of acts of terror, violence, is uh, there's a lot of, of potential fundraising that goes on for, for terrorism in the interior of the United States. So really, from our perspective, the, uh, the money aspects and the information sharing are really the main things that impact in Iowa. Now, I, I'll just throw out a question to you, since this is supposed to be kind of a thought thing too, and then we'll go ahead with, with my understanding of some of the Patriot Act. I think one of the real things we're facing here is, um, I think as a society, we really need to decide what we're dealing with. Is it a crime? Is it a war? Is it, is it civil enforcement? When is it what? Because that really impacts a lot on what rights apply to whom at those times. Uh, one of the things that the Patriot Act has done, and we're going to see this a couple ways, is that it has provided multi-jurisdictional capability. Now the slide says single jurisdiction search warrant, but as you can see from the arrows, what it really does is it allows someone, in this case in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, we could do the same thing in Des Moines or in Davenport or in Sioux City where we have the situs of federal courts in Iowa. Uh, we could go uh, to a court in that jurisdiction and in certain situations we could actually get the ability to do searches uh, extra district. We could go outside of either the northern or the southern district of Iowa. We could go outside of our circuit. We could really virtually go anywhere in the United States uh, to exercise certain warrants. Now, there are limited circumstances in which you would go to a FISA court to do some of these things. I am not a FISA court expert. In fact, I, I don't know anyone who really at this point, uh, short of some of the drafters, could really claim to be Patriot Act uh, experts. Uh, this is in small print, the Patriot Act, and as you know, I've got an awful lot of markers there, and there's a lot of highlighting beyond that. Uh, it, it's really a complex law. It touches a lot of other statutes. But one of the things you might think about in terms of distinguishing FISA court from regular criminal court is if you want to go, if you have something where, where you can't call it a crime, either by specific articulated reasonable suspicion or by probable cause, but it touches on the area of intelligence within the United States, you probably go to the FISA court. That's what that exists for. That's really more for, uh, for intelligence situations. Uh, if you can call it a crime, uh, and it's something one of our offices is dealing with, we would go to a, a federal magistrate judge or a federal, we call an article Roman numeral three judge, which is a plenary jurisdiction district court judge to do these things. So one of the comparisons that we would have would be uh, delayed notice of search. Uh, there are special provisions to be able to do this with the FISA court uh, where you can go and, and ordinarily when you exercise a search, uh, whether it's electronic or physical, you have to give the people who are the subject of the search uh, in control of the property being searched some sort of timely notice. Uh, under the Patriot Act, that can be delayed. In fact, it can be delayed on a repetitive basis indefinitely. The fact is, other than, the, than going to these intelligence situations which are outside the spectrum of crime itself, we have had this capability for quite a while. Uh, proverbially in the common law, we call them sneak and peek warrants. And, and a situation in which that might arise would be you're investigating a drug case and you know there's a cache of drugs or money or something at a certain location and you want to go in and, and see what's there, you have probable cause, and you want to make some recording of what you find. So for example, you want to photograph it. But you don't want to interrupt the flow of the crime because it's still under investigation. So you get a court authorized ability to sneak into the location and peek and see what they have and record that, usually photographically. And you don't have to leave a notice that you were there, at least at that time. There will come a time when you have to give notice and the court controls that. Uh, that's existed for quite a long while. Uh, the same thing with the idea of, of uh, getting search warrants. You can go to the FISA court in those intelligence situations and get the ability to go across the country on a single warrant. But the Patriot Act also amends Rule 41A of the, uh, of the Rules of Federal Criminal Procedure and allows that you can go, for example, to a judge in Des Moines and you can get a, a warrant to search the property or the person of someone in California. Now you still have to show all the things that you've always had to show in terms of a probable cause showing to the judge in order to get the warrant, but that warrant can be exercised within or without the jurisdiction.
Another thing is roving wiretaps. And again, the big distinction here is that with the FISA court, you can get that on a different standard, particularly dealing with a situation which you would not yet call a crime. But the fact is, and both Pat and I would have, would have used these in drug enforcement, uh, particularly you mentioned cell phones, uh, cell phone technology is intended to be mobile. So in order, and, and frankly, there is more use of cell phones than landlines with regard to criminal activity. Uh, in order to stay current with the technology, we have for some time had the ability to do a roving intercept of communications over those cell phones. So really the concept is not new. The extension is to the intelligence situation with the FISA court. Pen registers are the same thing. A pen register uh, registers literally the connections between telephones, not the communications per se, but one number connecting with another number. We've been able to do this for a long time. And I'll point out historically, these did not exist in the law when they were first recognized by the United States Supreme Court in a case coming out of New York. In that case, the United States Supreme Court found that under what we call the All Writs Act, under the rules of criminal procedure, that the court had an inherent power to grant this capability to intercept these digital, the dialings between two telephones. Well, that's now been extended, uh, where, and it's an ex parte order. We go in and get it uh, by making a showing of reasonable suspicion, claiming that there is an investigation and certifying to the court that this pertains to the investigation. But we can get that anywhere within the United States now. So again, really in terms of the law, there is not a significant extension here. Uh, stored electronic communications. Again, the main thing is, is it's, it's things we've been able to do before, but now we are without geographic limits. And I'm going to go through some of these kind of quickly and we'll entertain questions on them. Subscriber information. We've been able to get subscriber information for quite a while, particularly, again, drug cases, organized crime cases. What happens under the Patriot Act, though, is there is a more specific delineation of the information which is available uh, under that act. Uh, Access to business records and items, something again we've been able to do for quite a long while, either by court order, by administrative subpoena, by an agency, or most frequently, I think, in the United States Attorney's practice, by grand jury subpoenas. Grand jury subpoenas issued by the court, but in essence, the controlling of the issuance of the subpoenas by the United States Attorney's Office. Only in rare circumstances would we actually approach a court to get access to business records. There are some expanded capabilities under FISA to get records. Uh, but generally, it's the same power that we have had before, and the main extension is to intelligence situations rather than crimes. There are a number of examples, and I just picked one of them out of the Patriot Act, dealing with disclosure of consumer reports, and really this is set up on a kind of a three-level basis. There's some ability for an agency, for example, the FBI exercising its authority at the level of a special agent in charge, the special agent in charge of the FBI for Iowa is actually in Omaha, Nebraska, and deals with, uh, with three federal districts. Uh, that person is the lowest level within the FBI that could make a decision to exercise the authority in a consumer matter to get the identity, just the identifiers relative to an individual. If you actually want the consumer report, uh, you really need to, uh, to go to a court to get that. Uh, and one of the distinctions, and this applies, this actually comes out of the FISA language, but mm -hmm. Uh, the activity, the intelligence activity that's being looked at, if it's not a crime, m must be, that investigation must not be conducted solely upon the basis of activities protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which would include, for example, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, things like that. That cannot be the sole basis. The FISA court will not grant the authority to get into financial records, consumer records, and so forth, that that is the only allegation that is contained. There are some crimes that are either enhanced or created by the, uh, the, the Patriot Act, and I'm not going to go through all of them because there are actually quite a few. There are also definitions of terrorism, both domestic and, and international. But one of the things that, uh, that has been created is the bulk cash smuggling. And if you notice, many of these things we're talking about are not specifically limited to terrorism. Uh, the multi-jurisdictional search warrant was, in some circumstances, limited to terrorism, but the pen register, for example, uh, is not limited to terrorism. In fact, without giving any details, I will tell you that, that uh, our districts use these things, for example, in drug investigations, because they are not limited specifically to situations of terrorism. 
Bulk cash smuggling is one of those basically $10,000 in currents or other monetary instruments smuggling them in or out of the country. That might just as well apply to a drug situation as to, to, as to terrorism, but the law is there and can be used. Todd? Uh, unlicensed mon money transmitting businesses, I'll just tell you that generally there's a requirement that either under federal registration or state law, if you're going to engage in money transmitting businesses, you have to be licensed. If you don't have a license, you're, you're subject to violation of the statute, 18 United States Code, Section 1960. That's not new with the Patriot Act. That's been there for some time. What is new is what we call the sinker or knowledge requirement that whether or not the defendant knew that the operation was required to be licensed or that the operation was so punishable. That's the difference in the statute that the Patriot Act makes. Uh, extended venue regarding money laundering. Uh, this is kind of a change, and I'll tell you, we had a successful prosecution in the Southern District of Iowa just recently using this. It's public record. I'll tell you that it involved Access Air, which is no longer with us in Des Moines. Uh, it involved a leasing corporation for jets. And basically what happened is, although they were not doing the money laundering in the Southern District of Iowa, they were transmitting money from Des Moines that was the proceeds of the illegal activity. It was going to offshore accounts, this is all alleged in the public record, and the real money laundering was occurring in those offshore accounts, so outside of the regular jurisdiction of the United States. But under the Patriot Act, that was able to be prosecuted in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, because that's the way the elements of the crime read now. Uh, Uh, mandatory detention of suspected terrorists. Uh, and this is probably one of the more interesting areas to really get into in the Patriot Act. In fact, the whole area of immigration law and detention is a really very interesting area. I'm not an expert, but I've become much more familiar with it since September 11th, 2001. Uh, basically, it amends an existing statute, a series of, of statutes. It requires, whenever the law says shall, it means must. The Attorney General, which means uh, Immigration and Naturalization, now Immigration and Customs, must take custody of an alien certified to be, and that's my parentheses there, a terrorist. It's a lengthy definition that's in the statute. Or engaged in any other activity that endangers the national security of the United States. So have to take custody of the person. Uh, removal proceedings or a criminal charge, however, must be brought within seven days. Or the individual must be released under the statute. Uh, the, the detention can be extended from time to time for six months at a time, uh, subject to the alien requesting review and presenting evidence uh, as to why the alien is not within the classification of what I've called a terrorist under the statute. Uh, these are important considerations, though. The time limitation in terms of bringing an action for removal or, deten or, or charging with a crime is very important, and the fact that there is regular cyclical review is very important in satisfying Supreme Court requirements. Um, and basically you can keep rolling over this six months if the release of the alien will threaten the national security of the United States or the safety of the community or any person. There is a right for the individual so detained to challenge the detention uh, by an act of, uh, of habeas corpus, which can be brought to either the Supreme Court, and this is a paraphrase, there's really four categories, or to the District of Columbia Circuit Court. Uh, there's an appeal then to the full court, there's also the ability of an appeal to the Supreme Court. And every six months, there has to be a report by the Attorney General to a select committee of Congress relative to the use of any detention under this statute. Um, I raised this case. I just don't know how many of you know about this even. This occurred in Ames, Iowa about a year ago. The Joint Terrorism Task Force actually made an arrest here. It didn't make an arrest under the Patriot Act. It made an arrest under the firearm statutes of the United States. Juan Israf Juan Muhammad, a Malaysian national, domiciled in Ames, working in uh, uh, north central uh, Iowa, an Iowa State graduate, uh, actually fairly talented with regard to software al applications. He was convicted of being a, f a foreign national in possession of a firearm. It, it is a technical violation. He received a year and a month in prison as a result of a plea of guilty, and immediately following imprisonment, he will be deported. At the time, the Joint Terrorism Task Force exercised a bona fide federal court search warrant in Ames, Iowa. They found a Marlin 3030 caliber rifle, a Russian SKS semi-automatic easily converted to automatic rifle with retracted fixed bayonet, a 30-round magazine, which actually in many situations in itself would be a separate firearms violation, a 12-gauge shotgun, 175 12-gauge shotgun slugs, which is about five years of normal hunting. 
2,300 rounds of ammunition. Uh, there are also a number of other videos and uh, pamphlets with regard to engaging in warfare acts of violence, including taking down and killing people with body armor, which in the United States are generally the police. And when confronted and, and uh, questioned by the Joint Terrorism Tra Task Force, he openly stated that he was Mujahideen, a holy warrior, that he was preparing for combat, that he would definitely want to go to Chechnya and engage in combat against the Russians, and he was undecided about going at that time to Afghanistan to engage in combat against Americans. My time is up. I think we'll leave it at that and, and uh, rest with questions after that. Thank you. For the other side of the uh, issue, Ben Stone. Um, I guess that uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. It's uh, always nice to be in this room. This is the room that I was, uh, my wedding reception was in this room. Uh, so I have fond memories of this place. Um, uh, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I want to start off by saying that if you have a really keen interest in this information, uh, please go to uh, the ACLU's website and look at all kinds of stuff there. If you're interested, you can also go to the life and liberty dot gov. I'll plug it for you. Um, but go to the ACLU one too. Don't just go to theirs. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the it's ACLU dot org. Um, and uh, if you're interested in membership, I've got some envelopes over there and there's some newsletters. Um, we're a nonprofit organization, and we really do uh, require membership to stay afloat. And it's it's growing quite a bit lately um, for reasons that I suppose many of you can understand. Um, I want to I want to touch on a uh, on a theme that's going to kind of underline most everything that I talk about in the next 20 minutes, um, and that theme is that you know some of you may have heard that you know, we're a nation of laws, not of men. And I remember learning that in you know, undergraduate. You know what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Um, well, it's basically the idea that you one single person cannot control you. Whether it's a president or a king or a dictator, one person, one man, does not dictate the law. And under everything I'm going to talk about, whether it's the Patriot Act or enemy combatants or Guantanamo Bay, it's about that. It's about in a democracy, laws are what govern what happens. You don't pass a law that says the executive branch can have all the discretion at once in a given area with virtually no involvement by the judicial branch. Um, that isn't how democracies work. It checks and balances, accountability, transparency. So that's going to undergird most everything that I talk about. Uh, the fact that we have today uh, a PowerPoint presentation and, and both uh, U.S. attorneys for the state of Iowa uh, is really, I think, revealing. You may recall that last summer, John Ashcroft went on a tour, and his tour included Des Moines, Iowa, and he spoke about the Patriot Act. He, he wouldn't speak to average, everyday Iowans. He spoke only to closed audiences of law enforcement. And the whole point was to, um, it, was, it was a speaking tour, it was a, to go out and talk about the Patriot Act and, and try and dispel what they uh, conceived to be myths uh, often put out by the ACLU, uh, according to them. And back then, uh, last August, I believe that there were about 150 states and cities and communities that had passed resolutions in opposition to the Patriot Act. Uh, well, in the six months, five months, whatever it is, uh, since he was here, uh, that number has grown, uh, I found out just this afternoon, to 250. This afternoon, New York City passed a resolution calling for amendments to the Patriot Act, uh, and LA passed it last week. So it's approaching, I don't know, 60 million people who are covered by the uh, areas that are, um, have had resolutions passed. Uh, the Bill of Rights Defense Committees, there's an effort here in Ames uh, to do this as well, and other cities. So, and you may have heard in the, in the uh, State of the Union address that the, the President spoke about renewing the Patriot Act and, and not letting the sunset provisions make uh, portions of it go under. Well, a few months ago, uh, back in November, he was talking about expanding the powers that the government has uh, related to the Patriot Act. Um, 
He didn't call for expansion. You know why? Because people in Congress, liberals, conservatives, people in between, uh, have no interest in seeing an expansion of the powers uh, for the Justice Department. From the Rutherford Institute to uh, Phyllis Schlafly, the Eagle Forum, to the Free Congress Foundation, to uh, the National Gun Owners, to um, the uh, uh, American Family Association, uh, conservative groups, uh, the American Americans for Tax Reform, uh, Grover Norquist, I mean, these people have conservative credentials that are unmatched. And they're not thrilled with expanding government power, particularly the power of the executive. Remember, we're talking about primarily the power of the executive. In the United States, we have three branches of government, and the idea is checks and balances. Judicial branch checks the executive branch, checks the legislative branch, legislative branch checks the executive branch. And that's been thrown out of kilter by the Patriot Act. And so those are things to keep in mind. I do want to touch briefly on two very big issues. I don't want to spend a lot of time on them because we can maybe do it during the question and answer, but uh, they're really very important. There are two basic areas where the United States Supreme Court has decided to, to get involved. Uh, the first one I'll mention is the detention of foreign nationals at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. The United States Supreme Court has decided to take the case, there's two cases actually, and they're only gonna decide whether or not the United States federal court system has jurisdiction over whether or not the treatment of these uh, people that were basically picked up in Afghanistan, a few other places, uh, whether or not these people have access to the court system in the United States. And there's a lot of technical arguments there. I mean, get into some later, I'm not sure Mr. Reinhardt has some knowledge on that area. The other one I want to uh, bring about is the uh, enemy combatants. I'm sure most of you in this room have heard of, of Hamdi and Padilla. Well, the case of uh, Yasser Hamdi um, was accepted by the United States Supreme Court, uh, I believe in December, and uh, just last week, uh, the, well, actually last month, on December 18th, the case of uh, Padilla, uh, Padilla is the, is the man who was picked up uh, in Chicago, United States citizen, and he's currently in a military grade. Uh, he's had no charges filed, he hasn't seen, hasn't seen an attorney yet. Um, anyway, there was a, a case uh, ruled by the Second Circuit in December, which ruled that uh, he should have some access to an attorney and uh, some kind of process whereby to challenge his detention. Um, and so that case, uh, just today, the government filed for a petition for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. In the Padilla case, they lost, uh, the government lost at the uh, federal appeals court level. So there's a pretty good likelihood that, that Padilla will be picked up as well, and we'll have the Padilla and Hamdi enemy combatants situation being confronted by the United States Supreme Court, and also the question of whether or not uh, people in Guantanamo Bay have the right to uh, have jurisdiction by the federal court system on their situation. And it is difficult to exaggerate the magnitude of these cases. You can go back to the Magna Carta, and I meant to double check, I think it was 1215, the Magna Carta in England that limited the power of the king to imprison people. And obviously, the United States should go back to the, the Bill of Rights, the writ of habeas corpus before that. The writ of habeas corpus is something four or five hundred years old. The notion that an executive, on his or her own, with no involvement from anybody else in the judicial branch or the legislative branch, could have the power to declare someone an enemy combatant, take them off the streets of the United States as an American citizen, lock them up, no charges, no trial, no lawyer, no contact, forever, until the war on terrorism is over. That is a power that is unparalleled in Anglo-Saxon law for centuries. And the Supreme Court of the United States will decide this by June, and I hope you have an interest in this, and, uh, and follow it, because it's going to be something to be very uh, aware of 
if you believe in prayer, pray for the court to understand the magnitude of that question. Now, getting to the Patriot Act, um, I'm not going to get into a lot of details. First of all, I thought it was a very nice presentation. Um, many of the things in the Patriot Act are fine. They make very good sense. It's a very, very big bill. 342 pages, I believe. And uh, the ACLU actually has not called for the repeal of a single section of the Patriot Act. Um, there was an act, in, in a, pre a bill in Congress called the SAFE Act. It's a security and I can't remember what it is. <laughs> All these acronyms. Whoever thought of that Patriot Act acronym, that was created. I don't know if that was being done or not. But, um, anyway, there's a SAFE Act acronym, and it's, uh, it calls for the change of four different sections. I'll touch on those briefly in a little bit. I do want to mention the, uh, what we've been dealing with in the ACLU and, and other organizations. Like I say, it's, it's not just the ACLU. It's the Free Congress Foundation. It's the American Taxpayers Union. It's uh, all kinds of groups. Um, are concerned with the Patriot Act. And, you know, there's, there's like I mentioned this website that the um, Justice Department has put up called lifeandliberty.gov. And, you know, it really is disconcerting to have to say that there has been many uh, distortions and outright lies by the Justice Department. Now, for all I know, these gentlemen up here are doing their best to make the Justice Department uphold fairness and, and, uh, and rightness in what they do. But, the simple fact is that there have been uh, instances of the spokespeople for the Justice Department at the national level uh, repeatedly saying things like that Section 215, the, the section that deals with, that can be used on library records, does not apply to United States citizens, that probable cause is required, um, both of which are absolutely false. Uh, go back to the law. Uh, it's important to realize that uh, you know, John Ashcroft last September spoke about, after two years of saying that it was classified, whether or not the Justice Department had used Section 215 to access library records, he decided to declassify that information and stated that it has not been used not even once. Well, a couple ways to respond to that. One is, that's good. Another is, well, then you must not need it and you ought to repeal it. And another response is that we don't really know how much that means because uh, there have been instances where uh, Viet Din, uh, the chief author of the Patriot Act, actually has stated that at one point uh, 50 different libraries have been approached uh, on a voluntary basis to provide information. So, um, but it is interesting that, that this classified information was all of a sudden declassified when Ashcroft went on his tour to promote the Patriot Act. Um, some other instances that, that should be noted have to do with uh, uh, the fact that uh, two, Section 215 was described by the Justice Department for several months as only applying to business records. What well, doesn't apply to any tangible things. It's right in the bill. Um, and they've quit doing this after a while. They finally decided that they could no longer get away with it. Um, They've also talked about how you must convince a judge before you can get information under Section 215. Well, what they don't say about that is that Section 215 basically says, and uh, you can read it for yourself, states that uh, if the uh, Attorney General, Justice Department, whichever, I'm not sure which one it is, uh, certifies that the information is being sought for an ongoing investigation uh, of an uh, intelligence nature, terrorist nature. Um, it's a... It's, uh, it's obtainable, and the judge shall issue the order for the information. So the judge really does not have the discretion that a typical federal judge would have in issuing a search warrant. And that is one of the things in the SAFE Act is to basically insist that, um, you know, that's a very low standard. You know, relevant to an ongoing investigation could be that your cousin knows somebody who's a neighbor of somebody who might be a criminal. Uh, relevancy is a very low standard, and uh, the SAFE Act asks that that standard be taken back to uh, that there is specific and articulable facts that, that uh, demonstrate that the person who, whose records are being sought, library records, business records, medical records, uh, is, is an agent of a federal, of a uh, foreign power. <coughs> um, 
Another thing that uh, was mentioned in the display here was that uh, First Amendment rights are protected, saying that um, if, you're United, if you're a United States person, permanent resident or citizen, you, the Justice Department cannot access your records uh, so based solely upon First Amendment protected activity. Well, that's really of little comfort when you realize that all that need to be done is for there to be another reason, like uh, maybe once you travel to the Middle East, or maybe you know somebody, maybe you're a neighbor, maybe you wrote a letter that was critical of some policy, and yet uh, there's something else that you've done that they can point to that is somewhat remotely suspicious, and bingo, it can be done. Now, is it being done? I would be. Rather doubt it, actually. But go back to the rule that we're a nation of laws, not of men. A law says they can do it. And if you have any understanding of history, it's very important to keep in mind that people tend to abuse power that are granted. Conservatives and liberals agree on that basic premise, that you simply cannot trust the government with unmatched power, unchecked power. We need judges looking after executive branch, law enforcement. And that's really what the changes that are sought are about. And I'll also mention that uh, uh, the Inspector General of the uh, Justice Department uh, issued a report that he's followed up on now since last June, uh, detailing some of the really terrible, terrible treatment of the detainees after 9-11, uh, these people that were deported, uh, ultimately, after months and months of detention, uh, they were abused. The report is very disconcerting. Um, and uh, in that investigation by the Inspector General, uh, they were told, this is the Inspector General within the Justice Department, they were told by people at this detention center in Manhattan that there were no videotapes to show the treatment of these individuals that were in custody. These people, almost all of them Muslim, 